Hello, greetings from New Zealand. Um, I'm going to talk to you about climate change and infectious disease. And in this uh, talk, I'm going to talk about some of the patterns about climate change and disease control that um, we, um, we observe. The focus in this talk will be on infectious disease. Uh, of course, uh, climate change affects many aspects of our health and uh, disease conditions. But here we are only going to talk about um, infectious disease. Now, one of the facts that we take for uh, given in this particular context is this, that um, anthropogenic climate change is now incontrovertible. And by this, we mean that that portion of climate change or that aspect of climate change that is caused by human beings is now more or less accepted, that, um, that human beings and human activities are responsible for part of the warming of the globe that we observe. To get a grip on that, let's uh, take a look at uh, the concept of the energy budget that Earth has. In other words, how much energy Earth receives and how much energy Earth gives out. Earth's main source of energy is from the sun rays and we see that, the, the, that about 29% um, about or roughly about 30% of the solar radiation that reaches the Earth is reflected and the rest 30% is absorbed and as they are absorbed and as Earth uh, reflects back some of these energies we see that um, part of this is absorbed by uh, by the oceans and the Earth's surface and a part of that is absorbed in the atmosphere in um, in the in the late 19th century the Swedish uh, the Swedish uh, chemist uh, Svante Arrhenius made a startling discovery and that discovery was that that carbon dioxide in atmosphere actually increases the temperature and he said that uh, and he um, therefore came to the conclusion that human activities that increase carbon dioxide concentration can lead to warming particularly global warming of course in those years his idea was content contested and people cited other reasons for possible global warming but by and large we know that um, both carbon dioxide concentration in the Earth's atmosphere is increasing and the global temperature is increasing as well. In 1958, Charles Keeling first observed and measured the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide in Mauna Loa. And since then, the concentration of carbon dioxide in parts per million by volume, PPM or PPMV, have been charted. What we get to see that there is almost a linear increment in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere starting uh, from about uh, 1958 onwards and you can see that there has been a very steady growth in that. For the first time in 2014, the concentration of carbon dioxide in atmosphere reached the level of 400 uh, ppm. However, it's been a little bit of less since then. But you nevertheless see that there's been a substantial increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since 1958 to so 1960s. This has resulted in increased temperature of the Earth's surface. And this is once again a, a curve that uh, charts um, the um, temperature of the Earth's surface, uh, particularly with the global land and ocean temperature um, index. And it charts the annual mean temperature and five-year running mean and you see that in both cases there is a persistent and continuous increase in the, um, uh, in, in, the in the Earth's temperature starting with 1880. As you can see from this graph, we see that um, you know in, in right after um, compared with what was the case right after the industrial era, the temperature has increased substantially by the end of uh, you know around 2010-ish. So we get to see that the temperature continuously increases and uh, compared with uh, the 1970s and 1980s, we now see that there is a steep almost 0.7 degrees centigrade rise in the global temperature. So now we have got two facts. One, there is an increase in the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and there is a corresponding increase in the global temperature. The other indicator of climate change is increased precipitation, which means that there is an increase in the rainfall um, throughout the world. 
and of course there is increase in rainfall um, all over um, you know in, in many different countries but for, let's take a look at what happens to the world as such here you can see um, you know measurement of rainfall worldwide between 1901 and 2013 and for these 112 years we get to see that starting with 1960s till now there have been for the for over the last 50 years there is increased rainfall worldwide and this is again quite uh, quite interesting because we get to see that progressively there are the, the precipitations are going to increase the third indicator of course um, related to um, uh, this um, this change of course is is the um, is uh, rise in the sea level because as global warming as the earth warms up the uh, the sea ice particularly in the arctic region increase as well i mean melt start melting as well this leads to increase in the volume of seawater and therefore um, an increase in the sea level you can see here roughly a three millimeter per year increase in the sea level and there is a steep rise in sea level starting with 1998 if that was a sea level change in terms of um, remains stable so over the last 15 years there is a significant change in the sea level and we see that almost 60 millimeter rise in the sea level since 1998 which is substantial when something like this happens we know that the coastal cities are going to be flooded and roughly um, 13 out of the 20 uh, large cities which contain large population um, are on the coasts in one or the other coast in the world in the sea coasts the ocean coasts and about 60 percent of humanity lives very close to um, close to a coastline therefore you can understand from this that as the temperature increases as the sea level increases as the precipitation increases um, there is an increase um, um, risk of uh, sea level rise and therefore um, surface water uh, you know accumulation and flood uh, which are quite um, quite serious and then we have uh, the other event that is uh, the other indicator of um, of um, global climate change or global warming is increase in extreme weather events this is both in terms of the number as well as in terms of the severity as you can see here that between 1980 and 2008 over a 28 year period and we have only considered cyclones as indicators we see that the cyclone related disorders have increased so there are there have been like 1200 plus cyclones in these 28 years quite substantial and they have killed about um, 400,000 plus people in this um, alone uh, on the, in those in just cyclones and 400,000 uh, people is roughly almost equal to uh, the you know the population of a whole city for example the city of Christchurch has roughly about 400,000 people so you can see that a whole city population have been wiped out of the last 28 years by cyclones alone and there are other extreme weather events for example floods for example um, um, extreme heat waves um, flood here is another example where you can see that uh, you know buses and trucks are submerged it's a, it's a fairly bad disaster and extreme heat events um, extreme heat stress um, heat waves 2014 was the hottest year recorded in history you can see that uh, in 2009 uh, in India we had in particularly parts of South Bengal we had uh, uh, cyclone Isla which was um, rather serious and you can see here uh, how it looks like and then there are other cyclones um, that are um, that we have seen so to uh, summarize, we see that there are three indicators for uh, climate change that we are worried about, that the heat and increased temperature of the Earth's surfaces, and this leads to changes in the ocean thermoclines, retreats of glaciers, um, melting of sea ice, corresponding rise in sea levels, and uh, temperatures uh, in the higher latitudes or the upper latitudes are uh, warmer or hotter than the mid or latitudes or in the tropics I mean, at least the, the the rise of temperature is projected to be uh, there is increased precipitation which means heavy rainfall and inundation and some places there will be droughts and some other places uh, there will be heavy rainfall and increased ev uh, events that are related to extreme weather events for example storms hurricanes El Nino phenomenon um, changes in the ocean thermoclines very frequent heat and cold waves 
So um, the the response to this um, sometimes has been um, in, in the form of health effects and uh, among the health effects we're only going to consider infectious diseases. However, we know that you know rising sea level will flood uh, major cities. There is a concern that the carbon emission needs to be brought down to roughly around 350 parts per million and it is expected that if uh, we are to survive long term then our temperature levels cannot exceed more than 2 degrees centigrade beyond the pre-industrial level. Of course, all of these things are uh, model, some, you know, are contested, uh, debated, but roughly this is, um, this almost sounds like a consensus or, uh, you know, uh, are some reasonable targets um, that we, ca we can talk about. Now, obviously, health effects, and among the health effects, infectious disease risks are some, uh, you know, are, are really serious. And um, as we can see over here, it's a very, very complex phenomenon. Basically, we know that as a result of climate change or uh, gl global warming, four or five things are very, very important. First of all, um, weather changes and extreme weather is, is, is a concern for, um, for healthcare and health scientists. Also, because of climate change and subsequent heating and, and, you know, and, and, and the resultant heating of the, of the Earth's surface, um, air quality worsens. We also see that there are changes in the oceans because the ocean temperature, uh, the sea temperature increases, the sea ice melts, and some other changes. And as a result of this, there are problems with, um, with water because the quality of the water will deteriorate. Um, uh, availability of water um, you know, equally all over the world will be affected. So there are issues around water security, particularly as the ocean levels rise, uh, the salinity of, um, of, the, of, the, of the rivers um, will change um, in some parts of the world. There will be need for increased groundwater extraction. All of these will have got their, uh, their, their major problems. And there will be damages to the ecosystems. However, as complex as this may be, there are, uh, there are means to, uh, to combat that. One of them is to, is to put more emphasis on mitigation of the climate changes, um, adaptation strategies, and all of these are tied together by the health systems. So, Let's take a look at what actually happens in case of uh, anthropogenic climate change. As we say that, uh, you know, anthropogenic climate change and greenhouse gas emissions can be controlled by mitigation efforts. And of course, there are other non-anthropogenic uh, climate change as well, uh, events. Th these are like natural climate forcings. For example, um, say solar um, activities or volcanic activities, all of these things are quite possible. And then in climate change, as we have already noted, um, there are changes in the climatic conditions, particularly or meteorological variables, uh, temperature changes, uh, precipitation changes, humidity changes, and wind patterns and extreme weather events precipitate uh, a number of uh, environmental effects. These include extreme weather events and um, changes on the ecosystems, and all of these in turn give rise to changes in social systems and in turn health effects. The health effect that we are really interested in relates to microbial proliferation because of the uh, changes in the temperature and changes in weather conditions. Uh, microbes uh, increase in number and their um, and, and, and severity, of course. The infectivity of, the, of different microbes increase, and these, in turn, are related to um, uh, infectious diseases or emergence of infectious diseases. In general, there are three ways in which, in, in which infectious diseases and their link to uh, global warming have been studied. The statistical modeling, of course, mathematical modeling, and landscape modeling. Each of them have given new insights and have generally stated that some diseases, for example, dengue and malaria, will be more widespread throughout the world than what they are now at the moment. And their, infectivity, and, and their infection rates, the attack rates, are going to go up. Their extent is going to go up, especially they will be more widespread um, make our more temperate regions as well as tropical regions that they are now. However, new and emergent infectious diseases will come up as well, particularly gastrointestinal outbreaks, water-related diseases, diarrheal diseases, respiratory diseases, infectious infections. All of these will progressively increase as uh, effects of climate change take place. Therefore, it is quite likely that we will be faced with identifying and managing of infectious diseases and some new and novel infectious diseases may rise. This brings us to the next point as to whether we can have a framework or um, you know the need for actually development of a framework that can uh, identify 
infectious diseases when such outbreaks occur and what can we do about it and what are some of the causal mechanisms uh, that we can um, that we can use. Now, Joseph Eisenberg, who is a University of Michigan-based epidemiologist, came up with a framework of climate change and infectious diseases based on what he termed as distal factors, proximal factors, transmission cycle of infectious diseases, and a disease burden. Let's take a look at that. By distal factor, um, by distal factor, um, Eisenberg, um, by distal factor, Eisenberg basically meant things like um, the basic principles of uh, climate change. For example, um, global warming. For example, rise in the uh, in the, in the in, in sea levels. Um, uh, you know, increased precipitation and uh, extreme weather events. These are not always observable, but they are in points or their their downstream effects are observable and can be measurable. And when some things happen, for example, population density at a particular place rises because of migration, then that is a measurable, um, uh, measurable event or measurable factor that can be termed as a proximal factor when an infection rises. The second thing about infection is a transmission cycle, how infections get uh, spread from one person to another person. It could be in the form of a vector-borne uh, disease transmission, or it could be in the form of a zoonosis, uh, which means that uh, animals are infected and they then transfer the infection to human beings or it can be anthroponosis which means human beings themselves are infected and they infect in turn another human being. So all of these uh, various um, mechanisms of transmission cycle in turn lead to disease burden, the different kinds of infectious diseases that occur. So here is the, uh, in some details, the framework that um, Eisenberg proposed and you can see here that there are basically four types of transmission cycles that we get to see. Anthroponosis is the topmost, the first type in which you find that humans infect other human beings. The second type of transmission is when humans being when human beings uh, pass the disease to a vector, or uh, human beings often harbor the disease; they become hosts, and vectors, which are arthropods, then carry the disease forward and then infect other human beings. Sometimes human beings, the third type is where human beings obtain the disease by their interaction with the environment. Uh, it is quite possible that, uh, and we'll see in an example, that global warmth can give rise to increased ocean temperatures and therefore there can be at times algal blooms or there can be coral uh, changes in the coral and there can be uh, proliferation of Vibrio cholerae and they find themselves in certain mollusks and when those mollusks, mollusks are eaten by human beings, when human beings eat those mollusks, then they suffer from uh, from cholera because the cholera germs are concentrated in those um, in, in those sea creatures. The fourth type of um, the fourth type of transmission cycle begins with when human beings in, interact with the environment, but they become then hosts and uh, their interaction with different kind of vectors. So um, so um, a non-human host, for example, an animal um, on which a vector or an arthropod actually sits on you know, they interact with human beings and then pass those infections. So all four kinds of interactions are possible. So let's take a look at uh, an example. Um, for example, um, we take uh, the, the concrete example of increased temperature as, a, as an indicator of climate change. And you can see that because of the increased temperature, the ocean surface warms. And, um, you know, the, as the ocean surface warms, we see that there is an increased risk of uh, cholerae uh, getting concentrated in shellfish and when humans consume the shellfish, um, they're at increased risk of, um, of, of developing cholera. Also, increased air conditioning systems, because of the, of the temperature problems, will lead to um, increase in the risk of um, you know, diseases, uh, infections such as legionellosis, that is legionella pneumophila, which is kind of a, a microorganism, which causes a, a, a peculiar form of pneumonia. Also, there are risks of dehydration, increased water consumption, and therefore waterborne diseases. For example, um, salmonellosis, E. coli infections. You can see, therefore, uh, the transmission cycles of human-host environment or human-human transmission cycles, they take their place. And therefore, we have got, uh, there is quite possible that uh, cholera, you know, the, the, the incidence or attack rates of cholera will increase, salmonellosis will increase. And we can create similar models for many other disease conditions that will become mainstream as the changes of climate, um, you know, climate changes and global warming and those um, extreme weather events, precipitations will take hold. 
So what can we do about it and, um, and, and who are the people who are going to be most uh, commonly affected? We of course know with respect to um, uh, global warming and heating up, uh, people who live in big cities and who, are, um, who live close to, um, close to um, heat islands, for example, the, the particularly the city center, the buildings, uh, tall buildings which reflect heat and uh, then make, the, um, make, te make temperatures warmer. Uh, those are the people who are going to suffer more from heat-related effects. And uh, there are similar people who, who become a, a little bit more sensitive and therefore more susceptible to develop um, heat-related heat stresses and heat-related diseases. And we can construct and conceptualize similar situations with people who probably live along the coastal lines and these people will have to be displaced or they will suffer from flood-related activities. So these are the people who are going to be more um, more susceptible to some of these changes. Poor people in particular will be highly vulnerable. For example, here we get to see that, uh, you know, people who live near a water body, say for example a river and a particularly polluted water body and who live in shacks, for example, um, really, really poor people, they are the ones that are more vulnerable to extreme weather events, for example. When a storm surges or when there is a, in, an event of a cyclone, these shacks are the ones that are most likely to be blown away and these people will have to be displaced. So these people, by the nature of their, um, by the nature of their wealth, their, their position in life, their position in society, um, where they're living, they're highly vulnerable to uh, impacts of climate change. So these are the people who need to be, um, who need to be paid attention to as to how do we protect these, their lives. So what can we do about them? Basically, we can mitigate or attempt to mitigate the effects of climate change or we can adapt um, to the to the effects of the climate change in order to look at the bigger picture so that we can uh, do something about uh, infectious diseases and uh, in terms of mitigation we have got a couple of strategies one we can be low carbon society for example is just an example nothing more than that is one can use wind farms to generate electricity and that can um, either supplement or can totally replace uh, fossil fuel based uh, electricity generation. Well, that's a big dream, but if we can do this, then um, we can be a little bit um, less reliant on fossil fuels and therefore we're less likely to add carbon uh, into the atmosphere or carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Other ways in which we can sequester carbon dioxide, which is already present in the atmosphere, um, into, into various systems. Um, one example is biosequestrations or creation of urban jungles and urban reforestation. That can be really helpful. What can we do in terms of adaptation? And one of the one of the best bits for adaptation strategies, particularly keeping in mind infectious diseases as a result to climate change, is establishment of a robust early warning system. Particularly for infectious diseases, establishment of disease surveillance systems is very, very important because then the moment you get a signal that infectious disease occurs, um, one can take action and can minimize the impact indirectly minimizing the impact of climate change that is going to take place. All of these will also need uh, you know, more education and more community awareness about uh, climate change and the possible downstream effects of climate change longer term, shorter term, what can we do to mitigate the effects of climate change and what can we do to adapt to climate change situations and global warming. Um, so in summary then, we see that climate change is a clear and a present danger which is brought about by increased greenhouse gas emissions and presence of them in the atmosphere. Uh, the three main indicators as far as understanding the health effects and infectious disease risks are increase in global temperature, increased spread precipitation and rainfall worldwide and increased uh, risks and increased severity of extreme weather events which is going to probably result in a much warmer wetter or uh, drier world depending on the latitude in which we, we live probably in the context of India it's going to be a warmer and wetter world rise in sea levels and floodings and these have got significant health and particular infectious disease uh, implications um, we know that the poor people are going to be particularly sensitive to those changes and we have got ways in which we can identify emergence of new infectious diseases and uh, it is quite possible to do some mitigation and adapt to those circumstances uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for listening to this, and I, um, I, I leave you with the message that let's do something about uh, the mitigation 
and educating other people and adapting to those circumstances so that we can minimize risks of infectious diseases. Thank you very much. Here are a list of here is a list of readings that you can do uh, that I uh, use for this uh, presentation. And I'm very happy, you know, I'd be very happy if you can, uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me and we could discuss this a little bit more. Thank you very much.